Welcome back to the CSS Podcast. Today, we're talking about a new and exciting web platform feature that lets you connect two elements together visually within a UI, even transcending the boundaries of the top layer. This is the Anchor Positioning API, and it's been in the works for a long time, but it's recently had some significant changes in the past few months. And now these features are finally in a browser engine, so let's dig into them. I'm so stoked on this feature. I've built positioning systems a few times, and the most complex one being Infizbug. And wowza, there's a lot of edge cases to account for and tons of math. I can't wait to get rid of all of it and do like the same thing with 70% less code. I've already mentally switched from wherever I put position relative give that thing an anchor name. And now I can just position against it. Anybody. Yeah, I just used this today. It was so useful. I love anchor positioning. Like it honestly has been such a missing feature and you don't even realize it until you're building these like, I I like to call it a layered UI where you have things on multiple layers visually. Oh, it's so needed. Streamy, streamy y'all, seriously. Yeah. So native anchoring on the web has not been possible before without some additional third party library or code or code that you have to write and then manage. And then you have to manage all of the repositioning based on viewport or you have to write resize observers for the screen size or lame. It's just a mess or intersection observers that things are moving around. <laughs> So anchor positioning via the anchor functions allows authors to now anchor an absolutely or fixed positioned element to one or more elements on the page. So you can have multiple anchors while also allowing them to try several positions to find the best one and avoid overlap or overflow. So you can use the boundaries of the viewport to realign, readjust, reposition things, which is really cool. Yep. And there are libraries that you can use today to do this type of UI, but they do require added scripting and they can also have performance side effects when you're scrolling. So it's just really nice that we have this natively now. And another superpower of this feature is that it supports anchoring elements across the top layer. So you couldn't do this in any other way. You can't do this in any other way. You'd have to manage all of that positioning logic yourself. But now you can anchor things like popovers and dialogues to the rest of your UI, which is why it's awesome for layered UIs. So this is going to be an overview of the API. We'll try to go quick, but there's a lot of a lot of pieces of this. Uh, we're going to just talk about how to use this, the options that you get with the native anchor positioning API. But I mostly just recommend that you try it out yourself. You could give it a go. Nothing like getting those hands on. Yeah, for sure. So to disambiguate some of this, we will be using a lot of the words anchor and position. And so we want to make it very clear that we want to separate the anchor element from the positioned element. So the anchor element. So if you imagine like a like a little question mark button that has more detail about a phrase, right? It might have a tooltip. That tooltip is the positioned element. And that little question mark button, uh, that is the anchor element. So anchor, you think of like a ship's anchor, and then the positioned element is a thing that's being positioned to the anchor. Yes. I I used to call this anchor and anchored, and I was like, that's way too confusing. So (laughs) anchor and position. Another common like use case or menu, so you could think about like a drop-down menu where you have a sub-menu, that that thing that opens a sub-menu, that's the anchor, and then the positioned element would be the sub-menu itself. Yeah, the one that stays still, like the element that's the anchor. So I guess, yeah, you drop an anchor and it doesn't move, and then you tether things to it, and that's the positioned element. Yes, these are uh, hopefully going to be clearer as we repeat them to you over and over and over again. (laughs) Yes. Make this a drinking game whenever we say anchor. (laughs) That's funny. Turn the CSS podcast into a drinking game. (laughs) (laughs) All right, well, let's start with step zero. So you want to look, we want to anchor something. And the first step is positioning. So anchor positioning builds on CSS absolute or fixed, like you were saying. And fixed position means we don't need to worry about containing block relationships. Oh, the freedom that that just sounds like, right? Got the positioned element can live anywhere in the DOM. And yeah, that freedom makes me think of Braveheart when he's like riding on the horse and he's like, freedom! <laughs> That's, that is how it feels to remove position relative and all the top and bottom garbage. Anyway, so to kick things off in this first step, you add position absolute or position fixed to your positioned element in order for the anchor functions to be valid. 
Yeah. So that's actually like an important note. You can't just start with anchor name. You have to start with positioning. So make sure that that thing is absolute or fixed position. And then you can add an anchor name. So to set up an anchor, you first give it a name that will be referenced later by the positioned element. So for the anchor element, again, imagine you have this little like question mark button that pops open a tooltip. You might want to add the code anchor dash name colon dash dash question mark. So what this does is it gives it an anchor name of question mark, which is a custom identifier, and it's prepended by a double dash. So this is a lot like a CSS variable. For this, it is required to to have that double dash. And this just signifies that this is a unique identifier that is author provided, where the author has created this name question mark and is now going to use it. Yep, we're in that game now where we're double dashing a lot of unique identifiers in our web uh, applications so that we can avoid sort of putting an ID on everything. And then each kind of CSS feature can reference different unique IDs on the page relevant to this feature. So the anchor name is not out of that loop. It's got to be in there too. So yeah, unique. if you have three question marks on the page, you're going to need three separate anchor names, which is what it is. Anyway, okay. Yeah. So now we're going to anchor our two elements together with position dash anchor. And the first way to connect an anchor to another one is with an implicit anchor. So the position anchor property defines the default anchor specifier for all anchor functions on that element. So this is kind of nice. It saves you from repeating yourself. You'll find in the explicit one, you have to be explicit about what you're anchoring to, which has its own superpowers, but the implicit anchor helps you avoid all of that repetition. So we add it to the element that we want to connect to the anchor, which is our positioned element, and it connects the name of the anchor to that positioned element. And now they're sort of linked. So if your anchor name is dash dash question mark, it would look like position dash anchor colon dash dash question dash mark. So that's how we're linking these two things together. Now, if you position your element, the browser knows where to put it. Yep. And also, uh, Adam mentioned, like, you do need a unique identifier right now for all these anchored items. There is a property called anchor scope. That is not implemented yet, but this would essentially let you write, you know, like if you have a list item and then every list item has a positioned element, you'd be able to scope it to the list item so you could have, you don't have to repeat every single time all of these unique positions for your anchors, which is just like view transitions, like the same kind of issue there. So that is hopefully coming in the future for anchor positioning where you could kind of write once gain all the benefits with anchor scope. I love that because, yeah, one of my demos, I have three media play buttons. And when you hover over them, then they show the title, you know, play, next, pause. Yeah. And so what I ended up doing to avoid a lot of CSS repetition, I put an inline custom property on there. That's the identifier. And then I just share that identifier to the anchor name and then to this position anchor. That way they're sort of linked up through a single inline style on the element. But I would love to get rid of that. That was junk. Yeah, no, exactly. And then it also just prevents like, you know, the opposite problem where you might have name clashes with identical components because it scopes them. So it's nice to have these features. But in V1, just make sure that you have unique IDs, which if you're generating content dynam dynamically, you probably already do that. Yeah. So it probably wouldn't be a problem with something like tooltips and like a Wikipedia page. You probably already have unique IDs for everything. I was kind of hoping it worked like scroll driven animations where it just finds the nearest scroller and that's the one that it's going to observe by default unless you give it a, a name otherwise. So I was hoping it would just like crawl the parents and look for an anchor name, find the button that had a name, but it's okay. I like this scope idea. So Well, this is actually quite different because for something like a popover or a dialogue, you don't necessarily have to have the anchoring element be a what's child. right next yeah. to it in the DOM. Exactly. So that's like one of the superpowers of something like Popover, uh, where if you're using tab navigation, it, it could be at the end of your document, like all of your popovers. Um, but then it knows, like the browser is able to determine that if you're entering that experience, that should be the next focus point. So it's not necessarily like the, the DOM order is one to one with um, maybe something like an animation that requires siblings and parent relationships. Cool. Sorry for that deviation, y'all. But I think that was an important <laughs> that was an important jump ahead. We, we always deviate. <laughs> <laughs> so step three here, once you have your anchor name and your position anchor, then you can now finally start positioning your anchors. And you can do this with the anchor function. So the way to do this is you would use the anchor function to position things either in like positioning logic, like absolute positioning that you're familiar with, or in other ways, but I'll start with that. So you could do something like top anchor 
bottom. And what this looks like is top colon, that's the property, and then the value is anchor, and that's a function. And then inside of that function, the argument is bottom. So this would position the top of the positioned element at the bottom of its anchor. So it would be underneath the anchor. And under two. So you, yeah, like un, right, right below it. Um, so you can also use the anchor function directly to set up anchor relationships. This is called an explicit anchor. And um, if you do that, then you can just skip using position anchor. So what you could do is say like top, and then the first argument inside the anchor function would be the name of the anchor, the anchor name. And you could reference like the question mark there. And then you'd have space and then the actual positioning. So bottom. So that would be an explicit anchor. You can do both. You could do either. But this is particularly useful if you have multiple anchors for a single positioned element, which is possible with anchor positioning. So you could have one anchor and say it has anchor name dash dash one, another anchor anchor name dash dash two, then you could position top left, bottom right based on two different anchors. So you could have the top and the left anchored to dash dash one at the bottom right, and then position the right bottom of that positioned element to the top left of the anchor. And it, this this dynamic, so if you drag to resize or resize the page, it automatically will reconfigure to be connected to its anchor. It's, it's like so cool. And I feel like when I say these things, it's kind of confusing. But when you see it right in front of you, it's very clear that you can have these multiple anchors with these explicit anchors or implicit anchors. And I'm telling you, just try it out. Like it, it is such a joy to use this API. Uh, so I was talking in physical properties in these examples, but you can also use logical properties. So instead of top, you could do inset block start, inset inline start instead of left instead of bottom, do inset block end, or for right, you could do like inset inline end. And if you are not familiar with logical properties, definitely check out episode 12, because that is a very key thing to know and to use in your web development repertoire. Uh, so definitely check out our episode on logical properties. Yep, I'm a convert. Now I only have to remember one method of how to describe box positions instead of two or four or however many else y'all are juggling. It's really nice. I have a metaphor, a visual for the double anchor, the double explicit anchor, which also just has a cool <laughs> name. <laughs> yes. It's like, a, so you got, you got two stationary items and then there's like a human in the middle and one hand reaches out and grabs one anchor and the other hand reaches out and grabs the other anchor. And now it's anchored to two different elements. And as they move around, my arms move. I've got one arm, it's up. And now my right arm is down and the left arm's up or both arms are down. You don't have to care. My hands are tethered to the anchors. And as a positioned human, I can now be anchored to two things at once. This sounds like a torture device. Like what happens if you pull them apart? Yeah, that's kind of where the metaphor, I was like, I need to make sure not to stretch apart this person. Or like, there's got to be like a Greek, uh, you know, statue that's like tethered between two things. Maybe it's pulling two ships together. Anyway. Maybe like a slinky. <laughs> yes, it's pulling on a slinky. It's way more fun. Two slinkies. <laughs> One slinky, two hands pulling at the slinky. Perfect. Someone draw it here. AI make this make us that. That'd be great. Right. Awesome. Okay. So that was implicit anchors and uh, explicit anchors. We went over physical and logical positioning of the positioned element against a stationary anchor. Okay. So we've got all additional alternative syntaxes here, and this one is called position area, which you might formally know as the lead singer. Well, no, it's not formally prints, but anyway, it's formally was called inset area. So I'm only going to say that uh, long enough for you to maybe change your mind. But for the rest of this, we're going to talk about position area. So forget I even said the other one, the Voldemort one, because it's it's dead. You don't need it. <laughs> Rest in peace. Rest in peace. That which shall not be named again. So people only remember position area. OK. And with implicit anchors, you can also use this position area feature. So this is a new layout mechanism included in the anchoring API. And the position area makes it easy, and it really is easy, to place anchored position elements relative to their respective anchors. And it works on a nine cell grid with the anchoring element in the center. Yes. So the one that shall not be named. Um... <laughs> This was a really recent rename. So position area is the current one. Uh, the old one, I'll whisper, was inset area. But the update is implemented in <laughs> Chrome 129. So uh, if you are using anchor positioning or trying it out in any version before that, which started in 125, just be aware that the old naming is inset area. The update is happening 129, but it will 
be supported as both inset area and position area until Chrome 131. So you have time to transition. But if you have any demos, please update them to the new syntax. Excellent. Thank you for that brief public service announcement. That was excellent. Okay. PSA. PSA. Yes. <laughs> All right. So here's an example of position area. Uh, we have position area top. And this places the positioned element at the top and it centers it to span the three columns that are above this element. So you're gonna have one column immediately above your element and then two in the kitty quarters or the kitty corners, like in the top left and top right. So there's like a top left quadrant, a top center quadrant and a top right quadrant. And when you say position area top, it's gonna to span all three, which is really great because what if your tooltip is wider than the thing it's anchoring on? It doesn't matter. Position area keeps it centered there. It's brilliant. You'll see it once you try it. You're like, holy cow, uh, that was a lot of reverse math I had to do before, and now it's gone. So another example is position area bottom places the element at the bottom center. Nice. Okay, so there's also, you can be explicit which grid columns or rows you want to span. So an example of, we have like position dash area colon top space span dash left. So this places the positioned element at the top center, and it also spans to the left of the anchor is really nice, almost like it's text aligned right to the right side of the anchor. Anyway, okay, so if you imagine a button, the anchor would be aligned to its right edge, yeah, just like I was saying, and then placed expanding to the left. And this would be similar to bottom colon anchor top and right colon anchor right, which is definitely more confusing to write and see than using position area, but sometimes you need both and we'll get into that. But anyway, accepts both physical and logical properties. So for logical properties, the previous example of position area top span left would be restated to position dash area, block dash start span span dash inline dash start. So that's basically block start, which is at the top <laughs> and span inline start is spanning that uh, left area, that left quadrant. So cool, try it out though. Yuna's got a visual. It's at anchor-tool.com. I just used it the other day and stole the little logical property CSS right from it and pasted it in my code and watched my tooltip go exactly where I wanted it to. Thanks for making that. I, I used it today too. This, I, you know, I feel like it reminded me why I started blogging, just to have like public notes for myself. <laughs> How do I do something? I'll build a tool to help me and hopefully everyone yeah, else. Yeah, leaving artifacts for self. I like doing that too. Very nice. Yeah. So anchor-tool.com um, is probably the easiest way for you to learn this because it very visually represents how things work, where they're moving to, especially when it comes to the spanning of the different areas. So definitely check that out. We'll have it in the show notes for you. I'm looking to see if anchor.style is taken. It is. Someone has anchor.style. Ah. Oh. AnchorTool.com, I think, is pretty cool. It though. is cool. It is cool. Okay. Anyway, sorry. <laughs> sorry for that deviation. Okay. So another feature that comes with the Anchor Positioning API is called Anchor Center. And this makes it easier for you to center your positioned element relative to its anchor with centering. So this is a new value that you can use with the justify self, align self, justify items, and align items properties. So you can combine this with other positioning values. Um, an example of how you might want to use this is if you're using the anchor function for positioning, you might have something like bottom anchor top or top anchor bottom. And then you'd want to justify this in the center. You would say justify dash self colon anchor dash center. And then this would sort of center that tooltip uh, or that element, the positioned element to its anchor. So that's just like a nice to know. If you're using position area, you don't really need this because there are specific cells in that nine cell grid visual where you can place things in the center like this. But if you're using the functional format of anchor positioning, then you might need anchor center. Nice. I like the functional format. That's cool. It totally is, isn't it? I mean, you're, there's a lot of functions in CSS now, but that is the yep. the functional style. Awesome. Okay. So now we have some bonus options. And so if you weren't super stoked on what you've heard so far, get ready for things that you didn't ask for that you didn't know you needed that are super duper rad. And I'm talking about <laughs> anchor dash size function. So anchor dash size with anchor positioning also comes the ability to leverage an anchor elements size, the width or height to apply styling. So this can come in really handy if you're doing directional or size changes based on the anchor. So an example is we got our positioned tooltip. We're gonna say position dash anchor in that question mark example. And we're gonna say max dash height colon calc. 
anchor dash size, open parentheses, height. So we're retrieving the height of the anchor, the thing that our positioned element is anchoring to, and multiplying it by two. So we're saying our, the height of our position tooltip cannot double the height of the thing it's anchored to. That's sick. That is just so rad. And you can use anchor dash size with the height or width properties or logical properties. So of course, if they're going to provide the physical ones, you got to supply the logical ones. And so the logical options are inline and block, as well as self dash inline and self dash block. Uh, those are just slightly different. So self inline is the length of the anchor element itself in the inline direction. Whereas inline is the length of the anchor elements containing block in the inline direction. And the same for block values. So cool, hopefully you tracked with that. And then we can also use anchor dash size on its own inside of a calc, like we showed in the example for the following properties you can pass it. Width, height, min width, min height, max width, max height, block size, inline size, min block size, min inline size, max block size, max inline size. Yeah, there's the logical and physical <laughs> all laid out for you. Nice, nice. Yeah, that could definitely be useful, especially if you're creating things that are based on sizes if you're doing something that's relative to the anchor. It's just like a nice to have when you need it. I don't know if everybody will be using this property, but when you need it, you don't have to try to calculate its size or keep the values preserved. You have this dynamic value of anchor size. Rad. So uh, at the beginning, we sort of teased one of the huge superpowers of this feature, which is that you could reposition things. So we talked about initially positioning things so far in this podcast, but there's also this feature where you could change those positions. So you can update them with a few different strategies. A first and foremost is a very beautiful, straightforward feature, which are the auto flip keywords. And these include flip block to flip your positioned element in the block direction, flip inline to flip it in the inline direction, and uh, start, which swaps the values of the start properties with each other um, and the end properties with each other. So you sort of get this like flip diagonal thing. <laughs> so it would be like margin block start and margin inline start. Essentially, you like m are mirroring things with all of these flip options. Another note here is that this is another recent rename where it was originally called position try options. It is now called position try fallbacks. And this is an immediate change that happens in Chrome 128. So the recommendation is if you do have any existing demos or you're playing with this, you can also use the shorthand of just position try. And then you don't have to worry about if it's position try fallbacks or options. It'll work with every version from 125 plus in Chrome. So you can always use the position try shorthand, uh, but position try fallbacks is the current name. And that's because you provide an initial value. So you provide some initial positioning and then you provide fallbacks if that initial positioning doesn't fit in the viewport or doesn't work with your UI. So you can use these auto flip values in position try fallbacks. And an example of putting this all together would be if you have a tooltip, you connect it with your position anchor, say it's the dash dash question mark again, then you would set up your initial position. So that would be position area using that nine cell grid format. Um, you could do position area top. And then you can say position dash try dash fallbacks flip dash block. So in this simple example, what we see is a tooltip that's positioned on top of this question mark. And then when it's about to exit the viewport, to say if you're scrolling, it'll flip in the block direction and reposition itself in a mirror below that question mark. So it does this automatically, like when you're about to reach the viewport edge, whether it's scroll or resize. So you can use all of these values individually, just like that example, or together. So you can have position dash try dash fallbacks. And then within that flip dash inline comma flip dash block comma, you could even do flip block flip inline. So you can have all of these variants yourself. And then if your element is initially positioned in the top left, the first option flip inline would flip it to the top right. The second option flip block flips it to the bottom left. And then the third option flip block flip inline with a space between would flip it to the bottom right. So you get all of the different auto positioning options with these flip keywords. Oh man, that is flipping awesome. <laughs> uh, I only realized that what about two seconds ago, <laughs> but I do have nice, a couple nice. comments. I can't believe that shorthand is saving bacon. Usually shorthand is taking your bacon, taking your bacon. That's just, Take a bacon. that's just fun to say. But in this case, shorthand is saving your bacon. That's really cool. 
Um, so great tip there. Another one was I just love all these flip keywords. They're they're very complementary or inversions or mirrors. Um, so yeah, mm-hmm. that's a really cool way to think about it. I, I think they forgot a couple keywords though. Are, are you ready for some keywords they forgot? Oh, this is going to be an Adam special, I can yeah. tell. <laughs> <laughs> they forgot flip out. They forgot mm. flip the table, flip the, <laughs> flip the script. And the last one you put on your feet is the flip flop. So you put that on your footer, you get the flip flop anyway. Well, Adam, like, I think you could make your own positions and make those names come to life. Oh, snap. That actually does go right into the next section. (laughs) You can build your own custom position try options, y'all. So you could name them as silly as uh, I would desire. And so this is useful if the basic browser ones aren't enough. Sweet. So, for example, you have a drop down menu that appears to the right of the menu. And when you want it to instead appear below the menu when there isn't enough horizontal space, you'll need to write your own position try. So, right, like all of a sudden the browser squeezes into a mobile layout and you don't want it just to flip to the other side of the button. You want it to flip under. So you got to define that yourself. And you do this with, of course, a new at rule called at position dash try. So let's define one of our own. It's going to need a custom identifier. So get used to those double dash names. And so we're going to say at position dash try dash dash bottom or dash dash, you know, flip flop or whatever. Flip out. Yep, flip (laughs) out. And you open up your curly brackets. And I'm in here. I'm going to say margin colon. I'm going to pass in some padding, which is like the padding that's around my element. So I can take account for that and it's positioning. And then I'm going to say position area bottom. So again, we're using those keywords that you're familiar with. We're using some calc and some variables that you're familiar with to try a position that's at the bottom underneath. And so we connect it kind of like we were doing before with position try fallbacks. So if I've got this menu item, this is my positioned element, and I'm going to target it with a selector. And I'm going to say margin left is that padding. So that way it's kind of off to the left of the right side of the button, you know, nicely looking like it shot out from it, but not like directly attached. Then we'll say position dash area colon right space span bottom. Awesome. And then we connect with our position try options with position dash try dash fallbacks. And we pass our custom one called dash dash bottom or flip flop or flip out, whatever it is that you called it. And you can combine default position try options with custom ones by saying position dash try dash fallbacks colon flip dash in line comma, dash, dash, whatever it is that you named your super rad uh, fallback position. So sick. Yeah. And this is really useful for if these default values are just like flipping it in line or block isn't enough. So the example that Adam gave had like a margin that you might want to change. So if you had like a, that sub menu that was positioned to the right, you might want to reposition what it looks like, not just the position area, but having some other properties that are being adjusted for in the position try format. So that could be really, really useful. This is like giving authors full control of the positioning and some additional styling capabilities there. Yeah, it's awesome. This API is so cool. It is cool. <laughs> so another cool thing is that if you are using the physical shorthands or the positioning that's like top left, bottom right, uh, which could be logical as well, you can animate these. So that's cool because you could sort of have these smooth animations between those position sets. Um, but one thing to note that's kind of like a gotcha is that Position area positions don't animate yet. There needs to be some work done still to enable animation from the different positions in that nine cell grid. Um, So just keep that in mind. If you see some demos where things are animating smoothly, that can't be done with position area. If you do check out anchortool.com, you might notice that the positions are animating smoothly and they are using position area. But this is because I'm using view transitions in that demo. So in that example, I'm I have this input where you're like clicking on the different positions that updates the position area value. And then I'm using view transitions to transition it smoothly so it looks nice. So that's why if you see it there, it's because of view transitions. But in the future, you should be able to animate position sets with position area. Too. Awesome. Okay, so that's the functional syntax, then the functional anchor syntax can be animated. And it's probably because those resolve to very fixed pixel values. But the the keywords uh, for position area are probably more discrete at the moment. And so they'd have to... Yeah, it's. I think it's specifically about, like, I don't remember what it was, but the engineers told me they had to sort of create like a new animation capability to support the inset positions, which was 
the position area positions. I forgot the name of it, too. It was like a whole project that has to be done to, to support that. But it will eventually happen. So Dang. Cool. Okay. Well, still super rad to just know that you can animate them from different sides and kind of makes the functional syntax the better choice if you're looking to animate things. And if you're looking for simple and quick, uh, you can go with position area. I also know with mine, I animated using transforms. So I positioned based on some very static feeling. Well, I mean, it's like a dynamic rich position system, but then I animated the transform position. So I didn't have to animate it moving around. I just animated it coming in and out. Anyway. Mm -hmm. Okay. So speaking of future, because it ain't done. Apparently, we got new engines being created just to support the animations of these things. Next is what we teased earlier, anchor-scope. So this is a part of the anchoring spec, not yet implemented in any browser, currently experimental, though, in Chrome, and targeted to come out in 128. Be excited. I don't think it's in 128. <laughs> Uh-oh. Targeted for TBD. Future date. <laughs> F- future date. Still be excited. It's probably still in Canary to go try out, so... Go make a demo with it. Hey, go make 20 demos with it and watch this feature uh, launch in an earlier version of the browser as they see how excited everyone is for Anchor Scope. So, okay, let's think about like uh, when a design pattern is reused. Like I was talking about earlier, I had multiple media buttons and they each needed their own anchored tooltip. And so instead of repeating a unique name for every single one of those media items, I can use Anchor Scope to prevent those clashes against those identical components. So again, we got an example from Uni here too, which is like a list contains positioned elements in each list item, and each wants to position themselves relative to the list item they're in. That could get really tedious. I mean, maybe if you're in like a loop in Svelte or in, in React, you can put an ID on these things and it's no big deal. But we got Anchor Scope coming so that it's even less of a deal for you. And here's how it would work with that list example. We've got li opening up our curly brackets. We're going to give them a name. So anchor dash name colon dash dash list dash item. Okay, that's the remember that's step one anyway. So this is our anchor defining itself as an anchor with the anchor name. And then we have anchor dash scope. This is our new futuristic property with a colon saying dash dash list dash item. So the same name as the anchor name. So the scope of this li is equal to the same name as the anchor dash name. Now we look at our positioned elements. So something inside of those list items that wants to be positioned against this, we say position colon absolute. And then we say position dash anchor colon list item dash dash list dash item. So we connect the positioned element to the anchored element. And then we say position area inline start. And without anchor scope, all of the LI items would be connected to one particular list item. Uh, this happened to me in my media example. They all positioned off the same one. And I was like, hey, what's going on? Yep. But with anchor-scope, they're allowed to position themselves relative to each of their contextual ones. This is really cool. And this, yeah, this reminds me of timeline scope with scroll German animation syntax, where you kind of get to mm-hmm. expose and define scopes for these things, which help you be a little bit more dynamic and drier in your styles. Yeah. So really useful feature, especially when you have a lot of like submenus or other things within your UI that you might want to position. Like if you have cards and you might have submenus in those cards with like favorite star, I don't know, share, that sort of thing. Mm -hmm. So even a little bit further down the line, a part of the V2 spec, things we're thinking about, things that definitely aren't available, but we would like to have. One of them is the ability to slide to sort of stay in the viewport the inset modified containing block instead of changing position. So right now, when you're using things like the flip keywords or any position try that you've created, you essentially switch from one position to another. So if you hit the boundaries of the viewport, you would switch it. Um, But what we would like is the ability to not have to switch, but kind of keep it in the view as much as you can until it doesn't make sense to anymore and then you might want to switch positions. Uh, So there's a lot of open questions there how to do that, what what the boundaries are, but hopefully we can get that as a V2. Nice. Visbug does that with its current tooltips. They're fixed positioned and as they as you hover on stuff and get a, a quite big tooltip sometimes, if it hits the right edge, it squeezes in. Yeah. And then the content starts to wrap. So it's no longer full width and it's aware of the viewport size and tries to stay in. A lot of these are just kind of funny. They're like little elements like, no, I'm still here. No, I'm still here. Look at me over here now. Well, it's not even the the size of the element. It's the ability to kind of like shift it into the page. It's going to shift the whole thing instead of squeeze it. Okay. Yeah. And I've implemented a tooltip like this before too, which was annoying (laughs) to implement, but that's kind of what it was. It was optimizing for the view of the element to stay like in a specific spot, say like above it, and then just kind of push it in and then shift it to the right to stay in the viewport. Nice. Oh man, I saw the name of this slide and I just thought of Goo Goo Dolls. I was like, they'd like (laughs) this feature. 
<laughs> There's a 90s joke for the one person in the crowd that got it. Thank you much. <laughs> <laughs> um, another thing, which is the number one question I get asked over and over again, uh, you know, you've got your positioned element and then everyone's like, all right, cool. I put a little arrow dingle on there. I got like a little triangle. I got a, a little swoopy that looks like a chat bubble thing. I want it to be on the correct side based on on where it's, especially as it positioned fallbacks and goes from, it's flipping from top to bottom. I want my little arrow to change sides. How do I do that? And then right now you cannot, but in the future you shall. And we're working on it. It's something that we are internally calling a tether element or something, some sort of pseudo element that you'll get the opportunity to style and it will flip and move and be on the appropriate side with the positioned element as you work around. So look forward to that. Yeah. The real challenge here is there's so many open questions. Like what happens when you animate things from one position to another? Like what happens to that arrow? How does it go from the top to the bottom smoothly? Like, does it disappear and then reappear? Like, what if you have that thing where you have an outline, you know, and it's kind of like you're doing an outline around the little carrot and the yeah. rest of the tooltip. I keep saying tooltip as an example, but it could be anything. How do you animate that without breaking the illusion? Like, what happens here? So it's a really nice feature to have, and it's a part of many, many examples of anchored elements, but it is a hard thing to solve for like exactly how to do that and what the options would be for styling this. But it's got Google brains on it, so maybe it'll get worked out. Not just Google. This idea came from Apple initially when we were like talking about anchor positioning in general. That was something that they had proposed as part of the feature set. Not yet something that is in V1. It's moved to the next version, probably V2, and that's it's probably going to be a while coming to figure this out. But uh, working group brains on this. Yes, nice. Much better. <laughs> so that is all for our show today on anchor positioning. Uh, we hope that this was an inspiring little overview of the current state of affairs with the new anchor positioning API. And I really encourage you to try it. I think that it, once you do, it's hard to go back. It's really, really fun to use this feature. So thank you for joining us. Yep, I agree. A position relative being required on some sort of elements so that I can position a child, it's 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 gone. It's leaving my brain, almost like float positioning. And I love it. I'm not sad to see <laughs> that go. Uh, if you have any CSS questions or if you just want to flip out, we would love to answer them on the show or see your code pen examples. Just tweet us at the hashtag CSS podcast. I'm Yuna on Twitter. That's at U-N-A. I'm at Argyle Inc. at A-R-G-Y-L-E-I-N-K. Your question could help a lot of people. And if you like the show, please give us a review on whatever podcast app you're using or share this podcast with a friend or someone you work with, someone entering the field, someone who's been in this field for a while. The reviews that you give us help other people find our show because of the algorithms, my friends. And that means that we could spend more time making more stuff for you. Yeah, if you want more of these, tell us, tell people. And thank you for listening. <laughs> we look forward to your questions and comments. We'll see you next time. Bye.